Okay, hello everyone. So uh, the next talk, um, which will be presented by uh, me, Olivier Stas, is called Agile Motion, Reinforcement Learning and Wall Body Model Predictive Control, Result and Prospect from the uh, Gepetto team. Uh, so basically we are a group of 30 people. We are located in Toulouse, south of France, and we have about uh, 260 days of sun in this nice part. So if you are a postdoc looking for a permanent research position at CNRS, we are welcoming you, looking for bright, uh, bright candidates, or we are just a great project about to start. So in February, we're gonna start a, a whole body motion uh, project using skin with a tomb, uh, the skin from uh, Professor Gondon Cheng. So we'll be uh, happy to um, receive some um, uh, your candidacy to, uh, to join this, uh, this project. So we are about uh, eight permanent researchers, which is a bit uh, unusual for a uh, laboratory, for example, in Japan or, or in US. We have four permanent researchers from CNRS, we are full-time researchers, and four um, academic people. And we have 20 PhD students, mostly funded by, um, by project. So um, what we're doing in my group is uh, basically working and the science of motion for anthropomorphic system. And what we are used to do is to uh, using a modeling approach, do motion planning, um, control, and learning through uh, optimization. Most of what we do is formulating optimization problems with two big type of application, biomechanics. And one of my colleagues, Bruno Wattier, who is actually the president of the French Society of Biomechanics, is around there if you want to, to, to chat with him. And for my part, I'm much more focusing on human and robots, and we have the chance to have a, to have a Talos a human and robot, which I will be talking about. And the main outcome of what we are doing are open source uh, software from uh, motion planning with the human pass planner, uh, I know that some of you are using HPP FCL, so it's coming from this uh, this part. So it's a reboot of um, FCL. Um, we also have developed uh, an implementation of the stack of tasks, which has been used by um, Power Robotics ten years ago, and they have done a product uh, on this. And uh, with Andrea Del Pete, we have built the TSID, which is a task task space inverse dynamics and which is still used by uh, other groups. Pinocchio, which I think is quite well known, I will talk about it uh, a bit, but mostly we're focusing on a recent work we've been doing in the frame of a European project called the Memory of Motion, which is Crocodile, uh, which aims at implementing a whole body model predictive control. So thanks to my um, previous, uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Steve and, and Majid for this very nice workshop and, and giving me the opportunity to, to show our work. It's a uh, fun uh, that we almost have no math in my presentation because everything has been already nicely introduced by my predecessors. So, um, well, we, we still have this, um, always this, uh, this, um, this new uh, reinforcement learning, which act as a magic. So for us, we actually see has, again, an optimization problems, which has higher, um, at a higher level. And I think it's very interesting actually to see what um, I think right now for me is one of the best group in, in, in this frame, which is the work of Marco Hutter, where reference plant learning, you have the robot being able to uh, learn how to um, go from gap and learn this very high dynamically motion, like uh, jumping in um, in a system, so you you still feel that um, it's a little bit shaky and a little bit imprecise. And actually, it's interesting because in the same group there are people doing nonlinear optimization. So this is uh, on the uh, right side. You have the latest um, uh, work of um, of Barbot um, um, Farshidian, and he made a very interesting actually. Um, sorry, comparison between reference model learning and nonlinear uh, system. Sorry about to come. And well, when you start to have complex environments like stepping stones, nonlinear predictive control is still better than reinforcement learning. So again, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, we should not have both. Actually, I think we should have both. <laughs> Take uh, both of the world. We should be as fast as neural networks when they are trained and learning all these very nice um, uh, information 
on the system and as precise as MPC. And I tried to, to, to show uh, in this talk how we, we mixed uh, both of the world. So actually, um, so I mean, you, you have people who want to do a deep learning uh, neural network and have a policy end-to-end, -end, taking only a sensor and giving directly the, um, uh, the talks. And well, actually, I've seen a lot of people trying, and this is extremely hard, mostly because we have a very difficult uh, problem. So we know that it's working quite well in low dimensional space, typically six. So when you are using a reduce model, well, this is, it works, it works quite well. And when you have a very nice robot where the low level system is very robust, very uh, um, strong against impact, then uh, you have a very nice implementation. Uh, we also did it, for example, uh, uh, about almost 10 years ago uh, with one of my PhD students to actually learn the uh, transition between a task and it, it's working quite uh, interestingly. But when you start to um, take into account inertia on, on the limbs and when you have it, for example, in this uh, on the Talos robot, which has strong legs and strong arms. And why I'm saying this is, for example, one of the problems that you have with um, robots such as Cassie or Digit that they have a very low payload because they are almost direct drive. And the problem is that with direct drive, it doesn't scale up very well. So we'll talk about it uh, later on. But if you look, for example, at Apollo or at Aptronic with our new uh, human robot, the main problem is that you have this huge uh, system. It's, it's eating up uh, quite a lot. So um, it would be nice to, uh, to have uh, other robots such as Kangaroo, which has a density a ratio between density and, and, um, and force, which is far better. And also something we find out is actually in the action space. When you start to take into account geometry and collision, the interaction between the dynamics and the collision doesn't play very well and create a lot of local minima, which are extremely difficult to actually uh, see uh, nicely. So when you are in industrial application, like for example, um, a company or factory, you need to be as precise as what you have seen with the um, um, uh, animal robot. And then we, we think uh, it, it we try to, to mix classical approach in AI to, to get the best of both worlds. So here you have a, a kind of um, uh, bird high view on what we are doing recently, currently in the humanoid community. So we usually have a motion planning system, which is generating, generating contact and constraints, which could, can be used by a finished state machine, for example, to guide your whole body controller. So I think this is what we have seen with the behavior tree, for instance, in the previous uh, system. I know that Aptronic like to mix behavior tree with finished state machine because they have uh, interest in both sides. Then from the contact and constraints and reference trajectory, we usually go to central dynamics uh, solved over an horizon with model predictive control, which is sent to a stabilization layer, thanks to a state estimator. We're gonna correct the difference between what you have planned and the current state of the system. And quite classically, we have a whole body controller, QP on the ARKL solver to send to the system. And this is, uh, so on each of this uh, part, I, I, I put some of the software that we have developed to, to handle this kind of, uh, uh, this part. And we've tried to apply on the, on the Talos human and robot. Uh, and when we specified, so I specified with my colleagues, uh, this robot, um, uh, the Pal Robotics went the tender and was able to build the uh, first Talos robot in one year. And we, we went or ran into a five years uh, debugging session where we were able finally to, to, to do some torque control working that I will show later on on this, uh, on this structure. The point is when you do that, especially with the, the limbs that are not taken classically in the central dynamics model, it's very, very far from what you get from a reduced model. So when you apply a classical modification uh, system, such as a dynamic filter from Kajita San, you end up with a five centimeter modification of the center of mass, which tells you about the impact of, your, uh, of the system. And even when you use a uh, small uh, robot, such as Bolt uh, by Majid, still the, uh, the legs, the impact of the, of the legs is important on the, on the reduced model. So this is one reason why We, um, we, we wanted to move to another direction, but here is, this is um, the, uh, the output of our contact planner. So the work of Steve Tonneau and Pierre Fenbach, Pierre Fenbach, which is now in the world, a French spin-off of Parabotics in France. And thanks to that, we were able to have, uh, with the inverse dynamics from Parabotics, 
to uh, to have torque sensor and which uh, compared to HRP2 where we had the, the robot. So here, thanks to the torque and given this high level system, the robot was able to keep uh, balance even with this um, this uh, high uh, variation of the system and and, and prompts with the plan. So again, uh, a result which will be presented tomorrow by uh, Nawel Villa, a postdoc uh, from our group. We were able to reach after three PhD, two postdoc, five years of debugging session that was a nightmare, uh, just to try to compensate for the flexibility. You know, we hold the debugging, but we are very happy to to show you this very large step on uh, on Talos. So now we have a robot that is sold. And on which you can do torque control and reproduce and go up to the state of the art that was uh, for me uh, shown by uh, George Mezanan uh, in DLR on Toro, um, where you have the same kind of robot. It's an electric based robot with harmonic drive, and you, it shows you that you, you can reach this, uh, this stage. So, in terms of agility, I, I, I fully agree that it's not like Nadia or <laughs> uh, Atlas, but in the same time of, um, of system, I'm, we are. Kind of, uh, kind of happy. So here we are using a robust control. So we have a set of games which are um, are robust in terms of uh, Lyapunov function, where the system is able to uh, to to um, to um, to be stable and uh, up to a, a given um, uh, error in terms of uh, the dynamics of the system. But still, we don't have a state feedback. We are working on that. Uh, we have an estimator, and uh, this is an uh, inverse dynamics working on uh, on the robot. And this is one from PAL Robotics. So still, in this system, we had to make a trick, actually, to handle the non-linear dynamics part because of this problem, these five centimeter of differences. So something which makes the differences is that uh, Nawel will tell you uh, tomorrow, he had a nice trick that he put directly inside the MPC, taking into account the dynamics of the of the, world, of the of the system. Still, if this is wrong, if you hit a limit of the limbs, then you are doomed. Your system just uh, going to a, a local minima, doesn't find a solution, and uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And uh, back in two, uh, 2016, uh, we were shocked by the presentation of a motodorf in IIQR. We thought, to be honest, that it was infeasible to solve at 100 hertz uh, primes with uh, 50,000 variables on a nonlinear system designing the contact. So we, we Nicola went to uh, Mansa, went to uh, a motodorf, spent three, uh, three months on that and working to have a to replace the system by whole body model predictive control. And uh, what happened with this system is we learn, we learn a lot by doing this. So here you can see that there is a memory and I, I will try to, to give you a, a hint on what we learn on, on doing this. Uh, so what we, what we learn is basically, sorry, the, uh, the system that we're trying to solve here, which is basically a model predictive control with a cost function when you put inside the dynamics, the contact, the um, the all inverse dynamics of the system is that when you do this, and as you may have seen onto the uh, the the nice video of uh, Emotodorov, is that you have plenty plenty of trajectory, which means that you have so many solutions that you are extremely sensitive to the uh, initial guess uh, of your of your uh, solution and uh, and the state. So what we decided to do is to use and, and actually. When you, when you try to solve the problem and you do the classical one saying, okay, put a control to zero with my current state, 50% of the time you fail. Okay, so you really need to inject knowledge into the system. And there is something which is well known in uh, classical um, complexity theory in computer science is the concept of oracle. So what we decided to try to say, okay, let's use machine learning as a kind of oracle and try to learn from memory counting machine learning a way to bootstrap the system so the main idea that we had is basically if the robot here is facing uh, a situation and that for example if something happens that we're able to uh, switch between different kind of uh, of uh, of solution based uh, based on this and that was uh, the start of this uh, memory of motion uh, European project led by uh, Nicolas Mansart who 
who developed uh, this approach, which was basically taking the formulation, just start focus on using the structure of the programs to have uh, a first efficient and simplistic implementation based on differential uh, dynamic programming. And what we did is a first, what, uh, a first implementation uh, using a simple algorithm. And then we used um, secondary function like constraints that we had a choice is either to use a projection-based method like SQP. And what we find out, it's very robust, but what happened, it's very inefficient. And if you try to solve the whole body problem, then this is not the right way to go. So what we decided to do is to go through penalty-based algorithm, augmented uh, Lagrangian. And in order to do that, you need to have a very uh, efficient uh, dynamical library uh, using uh, geometry as much as possible. And this is what we have done with Pinocchio. So here you have some numbers where we are able to have the whole body dynamics in five microseconds uh, or up to eight for a robot such as uh, Talos. And we also have uh, algorithmic derivative, which allow you to have a sensibility to the system. And actually we did, actually for dynamics, it was our fifth implementation over 15 years. So. Uh, this is something that usually I found is that uh, you have a students who comes and tell you, look, I use uh, Python. I was able to implement a uh, textbook algorithm in half a day, which is true. I mean, you can do it. No problem with that. Having a full library that you can develop, which is bug free, two years of work each time, minimum. And having this, we did template programming, Mathematica, code generation autom automatic. And we find out that if you want to use, for example, um, the uh, capabilities of so CPU to uh, actually um, and guess what's going to be the next instruction and use a cache. You really have to really pay attention on how you generally you use um, uh, the memory and how you write your code. And uh, with the latest development with code generation and contact dynamics, we are even faster. And now we are even in a, in a, in a state where between GPU and the new AMD uh, ARM uh, CPU, like the M1 or the uh, M2, uh, M1 Max and M2, or GPU, uh, it's not very clear what's going to be the best. And this is an interesting, interesting term on, on this regard. So based on this, uh, we've wrote two parts, a front hands, which basically will um, have the cost and the dynamics. So the cost will be basically um, the constraints, which are not equality, equality constraints. So the dynamics is the equality constraints. And you put uh, all the other parts in the um, objective function. Uh, we pay attention to multi-threading support, efficiency memory management. So we know that there may be some, some stuff which can be improved and we do, did the source code generation. And the back end is a dedicated uh, multiple shooting DDP solver where we try to improve again the constraints, but here you can see some agile motion. So uh, finally, and which can be applied to uh, several robots. So they were applied to, for example, uh, the animal robots. So Carlos Mastali from uh, Edinburgh is uh, doing a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, dynamical uh, motion, but you can also use it, for example, for ICOM. And the interesting part is that if you want to use a memory, the point is when you use a neural networks, what's going to happen is that if the system gives you a solution, the solution may be unfeasible. Okay, you have no guarantee that what's going to give you or uh, the neural networks will be feasible. And you have very nice robots like Cassi, which are super strong in terms of uh, <laughs> mechanics, which I think can handle. <laughs> very nicely uh, unfeasible solution. With Talos, I will be a bit more cautious. <laughs> so the point is for, for that is we, we are trying to uh, actually have a, a model predictive control, which is able to use this infeasible solution. And because he's, uh, the algorithm is able to do that, correct the infeasible solution and provide you a, a closed loop uh, solution. So here you can see that we have a nice uh, uh, video, like for example, um, sorry. Uh, uh, Talos jumping, of course, uh, you will not see Talos jumping on uh, for reality, or at least uh, this step, because the harmonic drives are too too fragile. Still, uh, when we apply this uh, this system on the benchmark, what we are able to to show that you are able to to run it at 50 hertz on iCub with 38 degree freedom, 100 hertz on uh, on Talos, but with a very powerful uh, uh, CPU, a Ryzen with 16 cores and um, a lot of cache of memory. But for example, for industrial robots, even for nine degrees, you can go up to two kilohertz. So whole body MPC is feasible, at least with this system. 
even so if it's fragile. So what we did is uh, the first things we did is a very simple experiment, a bit like we did on, on HRP2 with, uh, on HRP2 with, uh, with Mujoko. Mujoko, when it was a, um, a whole body MPC, now it's just a simulator, but back then it was a whole body MPC and we, we did the same experiment. And this is what we, we went so far with HRP2, whole body dynamics, 100 nodes, 1.5 seconds in the future, 100 milliseconds. The difference uh, here is that we do state feedback. We are not able to do state feedback with Mujoko. The robot and the state were too different. Here we are able to do that. And the thing is that here, when it's just one collision, okay, one collision, and when you don't put the memory with this just one collision, 50% of the time, the algorithm breaks. You need a memory as simple here as a Cummings, okay, actually for the system to be able in real time to follow an order of the user, which is just with a slider giving the position that the system wants to follow. And what you try to, to check here is everything talks, um, uh, the whole dynamics on the horizon, save collision. Now, the problem that you have with this is that, uh, as you can see here, we're trying to follow the, the cube. It's kind of imprecise because you are doing torque control. When you do torque control, however, what you gain is uh, the fact that the robot is much uh, safer. You can interact uh, with it. So here it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty classical, but for industrial partners, this is what they want. So here, this is something that you cannot do with a robot such as HRP2 with his torque control and uh, will have an admittance, for example, for the fit. You cannot do that, uh, whereas you can do this on torque control. And um, so uh, again, one interesting stuff is that it's a robot, you can buy it. Well, it's pretty expensive. Still, you can buy it and reproduce this kind of, uh, <laughs> of experiment. And that was not our goal. So the things that we couldn't do with Mujoko is walking. And actually, the main problem is that due to the convectification of the, uh, of the contact forces, the stuff we got for walking was pretty not feasible. Actually, I, I, it was stupid. HRP2 was on the edge of the, uh, of the system, so the output that we had were not feasible. We are, where here, the contact are rigid contact on the system, so we are closer to the dynamics. In order to break the complexity, however, we have to give the phases of the of the system. It's it's a trade-off. So here, the interesting part is that what I show you with the classical uh, reduce model is that we had to carefully model the um, the flexibility on the system. Here, we do not. And we do not, why? Because what we are doing is, so in a separated computer, we are computing at around 100 Hertz. Uh, we speak at during contact switching of uh, 50 milliseconds, um, the torque trajectory, and the things that you get with DDP is feedback gains. And what we do is we also send feedback gains to the low level torque control provided by PAL Robotics. And those gains are changing uh, on the system and which is providing us a very robust uh, behavior. So again, this is not super agile. Huh? This is not super fast. But again, it was done in six months by one student. And again, using whole body motion actually seems to be very easy to deploy, even if it's more complex. So here you have a stair climbing architect, uh, sorry, uh, experiment. And I had two other students, one doing sanding, the other one doing pointing on a pylon of, uh, of a plane. Both of them were very quick in deploying this kind of architecture. And, and so it, it's much easier actually to deploy than, the, uh, than what Enrico said, tuning the gains, which is always a nightmare. I hate multi-objective function for, for this kind of prison. And it looks like it's, uh, it's easy. So now the, the for us, the main question is that will we be able to be as performant as we, we, uh, I have shown you with um, classical approach than with whole body MPC. This is um, the big question mark. So now the, the problem with that is, um, uh, I, I, we assume that we have a model which matched actually uh, simulation and reality. And uh, when you have a powerful robot, this means that you need really a cumbersome uh, experimental model methodology, a bit like, uh, I don't know for Nadia actually, but actually for our robot, it's super powerful when it's diverging, it's, it's really, really, uh, it's not as powerful as an hydraulic system, but it's, it's, it's still scary. So we wanted to have something a bit more um, uh, easier in terms of difference between the model and, and simulation. 
And so we started to, to look at uh, other hardware uh, robots. And I think Widget was interesting is that uh, the fact that you almost have no harmonic drive because on Talos, actually, this is one of the weakest points. I don't have any problems with temperature. I'm not burning any motor. Each time the torque limits are harmonic drives, I'm blocking all the times when I'm diverging on the system. You don't have this on the uh, Digit system or the MIT because they are direct drive and which also very simplifies the estimation of the forces because you just read the current and down you have the forces. So I think this is super powerful. The problem is that it doesn't scale very well uh, in terms of, um, of uh, load that you can uh, have. So for example, on Talos, I was able to, to, to do push up during two hours, uh, not two hours, sorry, and standing uh, two kilogram um, with the straight arms. And believe me, it's super difficult. I, I couldn't stand more than one minute. And this guy was able to put, do some push-up with 30 kilogram on one arms, so which is kind of uh, powerful. And this is actually what our industrial partners are asking for. So for us, we, we believe that Kangaroo is a, a very interesting uh, platform on this, on this regard. And for Talos, actually one of the problems that we specify to have joint talks on all the, all the joints throughout part of the neck, and uh, you have uh, torque joints everywhere. The problem is that due to the uh, Elmo board limitation, the feedback is done on the main CPU giving us, uh, so we have some disagreement on this. Some partners of, uh, of the joint uh, of the project, I think that it's five hertz and others, uh, parabotics say it's 20 hertz, but, but it's very low. So you have a kind of cutoff frequency. So each time that you, your solution is talks with high variation, doesn't work at all. So we, um, thanks to Pad Robotics, they provided us a simulator implementing an identif identification of the, the, uh, the um, actuator dynamics, which I think is super important to make sure that your motion is working properly. But we, the point is that we were very unsatisfied by the, uh, the Elmo board. So we develop our own electronics and it's a joint work with uh, YNU and um, Max Planck Institute. And Majid was part of it, developing some systems. So we have this very nice robot uh, which is solo, and on which it's it's very fast to develop um, uh, actually uh, systems. So we use TSID, we use Crocodile for the central dynamics. Uh, so here we don't use ROS because I think um, ROS is usually a burden when you're doing torque control. The, when you're integrating, you need ROS. <laughs> when you just do ROS, um, when you just do uh, control, most of the people say that it's a burden. Uh, so we try to, to keep the boss well, and I'm trying to find a way to, uh, to integrate this uh, smoothly. The nice part with this robot is because we have a very good model, because we know everything, the noise of the sensor and so on. We did the reinforcement learning on Solo uh, with a, a PhD from Never Labs. And uh, using curriculum uh, reinforcement learning with the cost function is almost exactly the same that the one we are using for one modif modif model predictive control. You can see here uh, uh, the solo robot generating online motion where we did no modification from the simulation to the robot. Zero shot learning. Bam. So I think having a proper model simplify your life even for reinforcement learning. So we have a project, a uh, national project to buy um, uh, uh, a kangaroo robot. So I'm looking forward to work with Palo Robotics on this. And uh, one of our colleagues will, uh, Justin Carpentier, will buy a digit. So we hope that uh, in this uh, in this project we will be able to see the difference between both uh, both robots. And we have a, um, a joint lab with uh, with Palo Robotics. So it's still unofficial because we have some administrative stuff to to fix. But for us, it was very uh, important to work closely with the. Uh, uh, the, um, the the people who are building the, the robot and we are very far uh, close to to Barcelona, so it's very easy, and it changed um, everything. <laughs> this is something I learned from uh, you guys at uh, HMC and and uh, from Boston Dynamics. We really have to be close to the um, to the people building the robot to 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 improve it. So the memory of motion that we, we find out is we think that when you solve these problems, you have two, uh, two things, so trajectory optimization, and the, which is one part of the, of the system. And the other one is actually the vector field, which is the pole IC. So for us, it's, you, you can get the same, uh, it's two view of the same problems. And in order to, to, to run this, what we do is uh, we propose an algorithm where we explore the full state of the system. Uh, solve our optimization system on, 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 the, on one trajectory, cut it in sub-trajectory, and use uh, neural networks actually to learn 
the um, solution, the, so the state, the control, the value function. And uh, the interesting thing is that you can use it actually to, to explore efficiently the system because actually when you want to compute the distance between two points on the state space, it, you, you need to resolve again this optimization system. But just to make the comparison, you can use uh, the uh, neural networks as an approximation and just compute the one that you really want to make the transition on and to improve the data set. This is called what we call the IREPA policy approximation. And we applied it on the, uh, using a PyTorch and predicted uh, trajectory. We built an arena for the robot using our planner, the one that I showed previously by Steve Tono and, and uh, Pierre Fenbach. And we use it on the system. So the input are the, the blue parts. The blue part has basically a hate map. And based on the hate map, what, you, what, we, what, what we have directly is um, a set of contact uh, functions. So the, the, the input of the system is just the uh, small arrow that you see. Is, uh, what you get next is a series of, uh, of contact. And now the next phase for, for us will be to, uh, to join this, uh, this high-level uh, real-time um, real uh, planner with the uh, World Body MPC to, uh, to make a feasible uh, solution. So to conclude, we think that predictive control and advanced learning have a um, the same mathematical uh, problem. So we, we believe that it's gonna be the same final solution. Also, clearly there is some differences because, because you, you use the neural networks instead of having constant torques. But we think that if you uh, try to uh, optimize jointly the trajectory in the policy, we will still have guarantee and prior from, from motion planning. And, and we have the simplicity and versatility from learning. We have and everything I show you, we still don't take into account collision and geometry. I'm expecting that it's gonna be hard. Thank you very much.